Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, from uh, wherever you're joining us. Uh, good afternoon, if, uh, if it's already late there. Uh, we're joining here uh, today um, a number of experts in the solar thermal industry for industrial processes, and I'm really happy to welcome you to this webinar where we're going to be talking about what are the opportunities in this specific industry and how to harness them for industry. So here with me today, and guys, if you can give a little wave, you know, so people know who you are. I've got uh, an alphabetical order by company, uh, Rodrigo Mancilla from Corfo. He's joining us from Santiago de Chile, so it's quite early that where he is. Uh, we've got Ias from Glasspoint, who is actually joining at the moment. He's having some technical difficulty, but he'll be with us very soon. Then we have Martin uh, Hagen uh, from uh, Germany, from Industrial Solar. And we have Viera Fekova from the IFC, who is joining us from Istanbul. So we have Germany, uh, Chile, Istanbul. I'm from Madrid. I'm talking to you from Madrid. And there is Ias who's joining us from Kuwait. So we have a few people <laughs> from everywhere today. Uh, before we start, and I'm going to and I give the, um, you know, the, the microphone to Viera to put, give us a little bit of context, I'd like you to just ask a very quick question to you guys. So, Laila, can you please uh, show the poll? Um, just to make sure that we understand who is in the room, I would appreciate if you could just answer this one question that you should see on the screen right now, the panelists as well, please. And the question is very simple. What do you consider as the biggest barrier for concentrated solar thermal for industrial processes. Is it low awareness of the technology that is the biggest barrier? Is it high capex uh, for projects? Is it insufficient financial or financing opportunities? So you have issues to get to the finances. Or is it risks as an off taker? Is that what is putting you off? We're just trying to understand what are the biggest barriers today to deployment in, in your country. Low awareness, high capex, insufficient financing opportunities and off-taker risks. Uh, Laila, can you show us the results, please? Here we are. Let me see. Right. Okay. So this is to you guys as well. You know, you are going to be speaking to us now uh, to take into consideration people majorly think that low awareness and high capex are two of the biggest problems and actually almost equally as important. So you have to take that into consideration. And insufficient financing opportunities and off-take risks are not a problem at all. So if you can close that off. And, um, you know, without further ado, and knowing what we know now, uh, Viera, I give the floor to you to put us in a little bit of context on what we're doing here. Okay, so thank you very much. Let me start introducing my job because it gives a little bit of perspective. I am leading resource efficiency work, technical part of it across EMENA region, which covers like Central Asia, Europe, plus, plus all MENA, Pakistan and Afghanistan. So quite a wide, wide range. And we are working, uh, and my team is working with many industries, like manufacturing industries, from heavy capital intensive, like chemicals and cement, pulp and paper, through food processing, through whatever, from animal protein and farms and so on. So the, the perspective or experience comes from the region and from experience working with these industries. I would like to, in this intro, I would like to bring three, uh, three points or aspects for, for the discussion. But before that, let me, let me answer your question in a little bit different option. What we do see and we see as a root cause for uh, wider adoption of thermal solar, regardless if it is concentrated uh, solar, as, as we are talking today, or any other technological solution, what we do see and understand as a, as a root cause for not even considering the technology is the perception. So the perception for the moment is that while on uh, PV side, the solar PV, the development and decrease in pricing became to levels which are affordable and which really needs to be considered because they became financially feasible, this is not the case for concentrated solar. So concentrated solar for the moment is not trusted and is perceived as very high cost technology with uh, 
untrusted performance and results. So there is, there is a complex issue beyond this. It's not only high capex or it's not only one single reason. What we see on the mass side is really a combination of this. And usually the manufacturing clients are very conservative. So they don't like adventures and they don't like testing technologies that, that are not really proved, proven. So if I should see like where is the demand from or what drives the demand side for, for thermal, everybody at the table knows that the thermal energy proportion in the overall thermal overall energy use of, of companies might, might go very high. Depends on the sector. In cement or glass, the thermal proportion is much larger than in some other parts other sectors. But there is another aspect which is very important and this is the local fuel availability and local fuel pricing and costing. So just then as, a, as an example, over the recent years what we saw in Egypt because of lack of availability of gas and very high prices on fuels, the companies are much more flexible to consider innovative solutions and consider solutions that could replace the thermal or uh, provide thermal proportion of energy from renewable sources. So this seems like very favorable market for potential CSP. Unlike this, we have not experienced and I am not aware of any concrete project being considered by manufacturing clients at the moment for implementation. So this is in, in terms of like fuels itself. Uh, there is one more point where I can see uh, very substantial demand in future, which could come with the development of technology and, and uh, wider, wider adoption. And this is chilling. Absorption chillers are very widely used and this is technology that is trusted and developed like for tens of years. The temperature ranges that concentrated solar provides are much more suitable also for this type of chilling. So chilling needs that are linked to climate change and all from food to, to environment is something again what can what, what we see as opening market definitely something very interesting for us. In line with this, I would like to just bring an attention of the audience to, to a report that jointly with KIP uh, World Bank is, is developing and that should be issued in a few months time, which tries to address the barrier I mentioned at the beginning. The title of the, the name of the report is Concentrating Solar Power Technology Costs, Markets and Outlook. And it may happen that some of speakers is going to talk about this a little bit more. The last point is the IFC perspective. IFC is part of the World Bank Group, which supports private sector. So we are providing advice and investment to manufacturing clients, but also to, to financial sector and in, um, infrastructure. And climate change is at the heart of our uh, operations. So. From the financial perspective, we would be very happy to consider and to assess any of this type of projects, either on supplier or demand side. So I, I would stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Vera. Okay, so we, we have good news. We have uh, now ES also on the line, so we're all ready to go. So first speakers we discussed before is Martin. Uh, he's going to give us uh, a perspective from Industrial Solar, which is a company that is currently um, having clients, industrial clients in this area. So could you share your screen, Martin, with us and uh, make sure that you unmute your microphone? Yes, I think the screen is shared. Can you confirm? Okay, great. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Martin Hang from Industrial Solar. We are a company working for solar process heating for almost 10 years. First of all, thank you very much for the organizers, organizers to host this webinar. And also thank you very much to the audience for your interest in this topic, which is um, uh, highly appreciated by us because as we've seen also in the, in the question, awareness is still an issue. 
Um, let me get straight to my brief presentation on, on the topic, what I've prepared. Okay, now I does not move. Okay, so um, this is one of the installations. For example, how solar process heating is already applied in the MENA region. This is for me important to show that while the technology is new, um, systems are running like this already where a pharmaceutical company in Jordan is using concentrated solar energy to provide steam for their processes for more than two and a half years already. And this is in the middle of an industrial estate as you see in the surroundings. So um, as mentioned already by Viera, industry has a very high share for thermal energy demand. Depends a lot between the sectors, it depends between countries, but as an order of magnitude, you could say that two thirds of the industrial heat of the industrial energy demand is thermal, as you've seen on, in the left um, side in the, in the left uh, diagram. And if you look a bit deeper in the thermal energy demand, you can differentiate between low temperature, medium temperature, and high temperature um, processes. There's a big argument, okay, how to separate these. This is one indication. And at least when you talk about concentrating solar thermal technologies, definitely the temperatures of up to 400 degrees C can well be covered. There's some opportunity for the higher uh, temperatures as well, but um, this alone already provides more than enough opportunities for us all to, to work on. And I would not uh, say that the upper temperature is, is the maximum limit at the moment. So, um, if we look a bit deeper, what are typical example sectors or pro industries? Here you see some industrial sectors mentioned and more details on the uh, heat demand in the low and the medium sector and uh, the low and medium temperature range. So chemical is very um, high share of the, um, of the total industrial energy consumption. The, the chemical sector is very energy intensive food and beverage is, is mentioned as well. There are big arguments are always, okay, how to, how to define these. Some include also um, mining more to the chemical sectors, but you see already where, is the, where are the, the key sectors. And in all of these, even in the comparatively small sector here, for example, like the textile industries, if you look at the absolute numbers in, in, this, in countries, which has a substantial amount of textile industries, the potential is still huge. Um, we looked at the, at the industry and we've seen they have a very high energy demand in, for the thermal side. Briefly, at least, I also would like to widen the picture for a macro perspective. So in respect to the economy, we see already in countries which are not having high amounts of fossil fuels themselves, they import fossil fuels, so the costs are higher. And already I experience when I talk to potential end users that they see in some countries that the energy prices undermine their competitiveness compared, for example, especially with countries uh, with the fuel abundant countries of the Gulf. So this is definitely an issue. The consequence is that industry, especially heavy industry, relocates to countries with low energy costs. So in the other countries, there are less jobs. And finally, also on, on a macro perspective of from the government side of point of view, the reduction in energy imports also is beneficial for the, for the trade balance and also it reduces the dependency, especially in respect to the oil price, where prices are up and down a lot um, if we look, for example, at the last three years. So this eases the, the planning. On the social side a bit, um, job creation, both direct jobs in terms of applying solar thermal technologies is an issue as well, uh, indirect jobs by having more industry in a country where the heat is comparatively cheap available. For, furthermore, also it has distributional effects and on the environmental side, we have reduced CO2 emission and um, also other pollutants, a topic which I think should not be forgotten because often the industrial areas are quite close to, to the cities. So let's talk a bit more about a, just an example project. On the left-hand side, you see an example of the technology which we are using, it's, it's Fennel Collector. Um, I'm not going to go in any more details on the right hand side, you see the picture again. Um, you see that the collectors are installed on the roof, they're directly on top of the processes. And in front of the collectors, you see a little silver shiny um, drum, which is a steam drum, where we store the steam, which is generated in the collector. 
and um, forward it to the processes. At the same time, this uh, drum also serves as a storage to, to fluctuate or to minimize fluctuations between incoming irradiation and, and the offtake. So the collector is operating in direct steam generation mode. That's very convenient because um, steam is the most common heat, ex um, heat transfer fluid in, in industry. And as I mentioned, this project is commercial under operation since uh, March 2015, so more than two and a half years already. If you are interested in more details, there's a link. Um, you will also find it uh, in YouTube directly. Um, I'm not going to go into more technical details. I would highlight, like to highlight two things. They're important. So for any kind of process heating, it has to be integrated in the existing um, heat supply of the, of the factory. What I want to show on the left-hand side, yes, this is possible. So um, reliability of, of um, supply for the factory is technically not an issue at all. This being said, also the accuracy of the steam supply, which is when talking to end users in the first time is often a big question. I want to answer by the right hand side, for example, there's a the violet line right in the middle, which is the pressure. And over my conventional day, there is no pressure fluctuating at all. So bottom line of this slide, technically there's no limitation. Technology is not the bottleneck for the um, applying solar process heating. Here again, you see a picture of the, of the installation, of an example installation, and a very brief summary um, about the situation solar process heating. So um, due to the importance of the thermal energy for the um, industrial fuel consumption, solar process heating is needed to achieve, for example, the targets from the Paris Agreement, because in the sun-rich countries, also other alternatives like biomass is not available in this quantity as it would be needed. Furthermore, already today, solar process heating can compete with non-subsidized oil products. So yes, depends on the country where you are, but um, it is already in, in several locations uh, feasible uh, today. There are different technologies, there are different approaches. We hear another technology a bit later, but again, technology is not the bottleneck, neither in, in, in costs nor in um, availability or accuracy of um, integration, this is not the bottleneck. My experience when I'm talking to industrial end users is that key issue is, is financing. So given that um, we are in a country where at least we do not have to compete with very highly subsidized prices, still um, industry is often reluctant to make an investment which is in the end competing, for example, with other investments and in more in their core business. So even feasible projects are sometimes not realized due to competing investment opportunities. And this is, uh, in my perspective, from my experience, the, the key bottleneck. Coming to an end briefly, I would like to show a slide from, the, um, from IRENA. Um, according to their projection, solar process heating, and even here they mention only the, the low temperature processes, is the green part is the sector with the highest growth rate of solar thermal applications in, in the next decades. Uh, concentrated solar power generation is, is not uh, mentioned. Again, we can argue about the numbers, but the potential and the need is huge. So um, I'm hoping that also this webinar is a contribution to, to make the sector move. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward for a lively discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. If you can stop sharing your screen so that we can uh, allow Rodrigo to share his and just make sure that you put yourself on mute for now. Rodrigo, it's your turn. Just make it large screen and you're good. Just remember your microphone, Rodrigo, because it's not on. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Thank you, Valen, again for be for for let us be part of this uh, webinar again. This is the third time that particip we participate in in, in another webinar. So, uh, Valen asked me to talk about uh, what is the reality, what is happening in Chile nowadays with 
the concentrated solar thermal in, in industry, but in, specifically, uh, I'm going to talk about what is happening in the mining industry in the north of Chile. Just to give you a bit of context, uh, I am the head of this Chilean Solar Committee. This is an agency that is part of the Chilean Economic Development Agency and also works really close with the, with the uh, Ministry of Energy. Uh, we started two years ago and the main goal for us is to try to bring as many local companies as we can to the value chain of the solar uh, energy industry, uh, thinking not only to, to supply with and components for the development of projects in Chile, but also trying to see the opportunities that we can have uh, around. In that sense, uh, we've been working uh, with a lot of stakeholders, trying to see what is the, the key opportunity for Chile in, in solar. And we decided to start first to try to take advantage of what we call it is some kind of or singularity. The Atacama Desert, the area that is in, 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 in the square, in, in the screen, is a place in which uh, we have the, the highest solar irradiation in the world, and also uh, where the main copper mining activity is, uh, also worldwide. And also in that same place, we have the uh, biggest uh, lithium reserves uh, in the world. So we say that we here have a, a really good opportunity to, to help not only our uh, economy, but also the world in, in the different uh, revolutions that are happening around the world. Specif especially, uh, we are seeing with really great, uh, with a really uh, great opportunity for us, the, the uh, electromobility revolution worldwide. So one electric car uses uh, close to four to five times the uh, amount of copper that is needed uh, in a convention, conventional car. Um, also, this new electric car is going to use lithium. Uh, the main producer of lithium is Australia, but uh, since we have uh, the, the half of the total reserves in the world, we can have here also another opportunity to help the, the electromobility to develop around the world. And we can produce copper and lithium with the lowest uh, footprint. And that's why we are working in, in this area with the mining sector to try to push, to try to encourage mining companies to use more solar energy in general not only electricity, but also trying to uh, incorporate more and more uh, solar in the uh, industrial processes. So about the potential, uh, we, three or four years ago, we performed a study that uh, identified what were the main potential for solar thermal solutions uh, across the country and in different uh, economic sectors. Uh, this graph is in Spanish, so I, I will try to show what are the main uh, key insights uh, of this study. So the copper industry uses or, or demand mainly low temperature uh, thermal solutions. And there is only a few uh, processes in which they use medium temperature processes. In terms of the high temperature processes, it is focused in some chemical industry that is uh, really a small part of our uh, economic, uh, or, or we have really few companies that are working in the chemical uh, industry in, in Chile. So the, the main uh, opportunities, at least in the copper and some other different industries like the agricultural, the dairy products, and, and food in general is more related to low temperature uh, solutions. The mining sector is the one that demands the most uh, electricity, 
almost one third of the electricity demand of the country is uh, from the mining sector. And uh, also the mining sector is one of the main uh, demand for uh, fossil fuels. Uh, in terms of the share between electricity and, and, and diesel consumption it is uh, more or less half and half. The demand for energy for, for mining is it is predicted that it's going to double in, in 10 years. And this is because the mining grades, the, the ore grades are getting lower. So to, to ex extract and produce the same amount of copper that we produce today, we are going to need more energy in the future, no, no matter uh, what are the uh, measures in energy efficiency that we can uh, promote in, in the future. These are the, the main uh, different processes in which we use or, or mining industry uses uh, fuels and, and electricity. And the main user of fuel is the, the open pit uh, kind of uh, mining production. And this is because of the need for transport and, and mainly this is focusing in fuels for, for uh, the, the big mining tracks in, in, in this industry. So this year, University of Chile performed study to try to see what are the different opportunities for the different solar thermal technologies that can be used in the different uh, processes in the mining industry. I just want to say that at least for thermal purposes, uh, it seems that the opportunity is going to continue be for uh, flat plates uh, mainly. We have nowadays in, in the north of Chile in one operation, one parabolic trough working, but it's not a good example because they are uh, heating water uh, up to eight, 80 to 90 the Celsius degrees by using this parabolic trough. So it's a really huge investment for the purpose of the, this uh, process. And uh, solar towers, parabolic dish, and solar furnaces, uh, it seems to be maybe in the future uh, the, that is going to have an opportunity to be part of the mining industry. But at least in the coming next 10 years, it, it seems that uh, we are still far away from, from it. Uh, in terms of electricity, it is not the, the, the topic of today's webinar, but also I wanted to show you that this is, at least for CSP technologies, the main opportunity uh, in Chile. So we've seen the decrease in prices around the world that uh, is going to give us, at least in our country, with uh, a DNI that is close to 3,500 kilowatt hour per square meter per year, an opportunity to bring more and more electricity coming from the, the sun to mining sector. The mining needs a 24-7 supply of electricity, so they now are trying to use some PV electricity, but uh, mostly for uh, a small different processes are not related to the main operation, so CSP could be a really good opportunity for them to try to lower the, the footprint and a good opportunity for CSP companies to bring more and more projects in, in Chile. So last year we had a tender for electricity in which one bidder uh, bid a price close to 64 US dollar per megawatt hour. Uh, to one week ago, uh, the, the Chilean government closed another tender for electricity. We don't have yet the prices uh, that were offered, but it seems that we are going to have Again, another price that is going to be a world record. Uh, so we hope that they can win this uh, time, the, the tender for electricity. What are the projects that already are uh, evaluating to have some concentrated solar power, so solar thermal uh, solutions for the uh, projects is this mining uh, projects, Del Tesoro, Gabriela Mistral, Lomas Vallas. So this is, focused and concentrated in the second region, that is the mining region uh, for, by excellence in, in Chile. Well, we also assess the opportunities for CST and, and for solar thermal in dif other different uh, sectors. You can see here 
what is the opportunity in terms of the economic opportunity for for the mining so the, the biggest uh, circle uh, indicates the biggest opportunity so but we, if we take out the mining sector you can see that we have also uh, big opportunities for uh, the dairy products uh, agriculture, food production, and also in, in cement production, but it's concentrated in, in the two or three regions in the center of, of Chile. And lastly, I just wanted to show you some of the examples that we have in, in the country. So I know that this is not a concentrated uh, solar thermal uh, solution, but it's one that is a really huge project that is part of the Codelco uh, mining company. Codelco is uh, probably the, the, the biggest copper mining company in the world and is uh, a state-owned company. They install uh, 36 uh, thermal, megawatt thermal uh, project using uh, flat collectors to the, with the purpose of uh, heating some solutions uh, to be part of the electro winning process. Uh, they are having a really good experience, so this could be the benchmark for any other projects uh, in solar thermal in, in the country. We also have a, a CST solution more in the center of the country that is focusing the concentrated grape juice uh, product. Uh, they are using this to to also to hit some solution for the for the process and last uh, we have a cogeneration and solar cooling winery in, in, in uh, the center of the country the, the winery industry is also an important industry in, in the country so you can have if you need more information about what they are doing this is a cogeneration so they are also using biomass to to heat and, and, and cool the production uh, there. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo. Leave it up to a Chilean to put mining and wine in the same uh, in the same speech, eh? Okay. So the last speaker before we go into the um, the questions and answers, although we're a little bit tight for time, is Ias. Ias, um, can you hear us? Your your uh, camera was on, but I see now that is no longer. So. Let me ask in the meanwhile, what we get ears back to you guys as an audience. Uh, I'm going to put another poll on. Uh, Lila, if you can send the second poll um, and see whether we can get hold of ears in the meanwhile. Okay, so what do you see as the best public support mechanism to kickstart concentrated solar thermal deployment? Um, so you guys, this is the, your turn to, to give your opinion. Do you think what we need is more capital support or equity grants in this direction? Do you think we need more obligations to actually get these projects done? Do we need soft loans or do we need tax reductions? What would be the mechanism that you think works best in order to start this, um, this industry in your country, in your region, whatever it is that you're moving? Let me just give you a couple of uh, seconds more. I'm, I'm seeing from the far the answers. And Laila, if you can show us, please, the answers, that would be great. Right, here we go. So capital support of equity grants, absolutely. Uh, here's what we think, you know, 60%, this is what's gonna help us. Thank you very much, Laila, you can close this. Yes, you ready now? Can you please share your presentation and also unmute yourself? Let me see. If... Hello, good morning, yes. Hi, good morning, uh, Belen. I had some technical difficulties at the beginning that is right. fine. We're glad that you've managed now. So if um, you can just share your screen, perfect. So, and just put it in large for us, please. Perfect. We're looking forward to hearing. I'm sorry, I have to go. You have about eight minutes. If um, I think if you press F5, it may work. There we go. Thank you. Go. Okay. Um, Good afternoon. Thank you for um, inviting me to present uh, to you today. I'll be uh, taking through the presentation on Glasspoint's uh, technology and the status of our project. I think some of the first slides are on the world energy use. Um, I think they were covered by Martin, so I'll, I'll just skim through them. Um, so here, um, basically, um, before we get into that, we'll just look at the world energy use um, according to the IEA. Um, the largest portion is the industrial energy use. 
And um, of that, 33%, um, nearly two thirds of this is industrial um, heat. So we can see how big of, uh, this, which is the largest piece of the world's um, largest energy market. I think also Martin covered um, um, more about um, kind of different um, applications require different temperatures with different technologies. And this is where um, CSP technology comes in. And for Glasspoint, we're looking um, basically at uh, enhanced oil recovery and um, going to higher temperatures there. Um, it covers the pet cans uh, uh, industry as well. So um, in this slide, we look at the opportunities for solar electricity and steam in the downstream industry. And it's 95 gigawatts electric and 190 gigawatts uh, thermal. Now looking at the um, upstream, um, we can see there are 12 gigawatts electric and 88 uh, gigawatts uh, thermal worth of opportunities. And uh, we are building uh, Mira, which is a one gigawatt um, uh, facility. So this is where um, Glasspoint technology comes in, and I'll take you through the progress um, on the Glasspoint project. And um, basically, it's where we produce a steam for uh, PDO's um, EOR efforts in Oman. So I'll just start off by talking about the enclosed um, trough technology. So we use parabolic trough collectors, and we take those collectors and bring them inside an agricultural uh, greenhouse. So the reason we use a, a greenhouse is that it creates an efficient structure and a zero wind environment. Uh, we basically, it lets us reduce the amount of raw material um, that we use throughout the entire system. So less stuff, uh, less weight, which means uh, less cost. And it's also easier to install and easier to maintain if it's all enclosed in a, in a greenhouse. So this is the pilot project we built um, in 2012 in Amal Oman. And uh, you can see here the greenhouse enclosure. Um, it protects the mirrors and reduces um, the capital cost. And on top of the greenhouse, you can see the automated uh, washing system. On the left side is the pilot we just saw. Um, it produces 50 tons of steam per day, and that's about seven megawatts peak and has been running for four years and has exceeded all our um, customers' expectations. And then in 2015, um, we announced that PDO was following up by awarding us the one gigawatt uh, Mira project at the same site. So I'm gonna show you some pictures of that uh, soon. Um, so going to the gigawatt scale, um, first we, should, we showed that we could um, scale our technology, uh, our organization, our supply chain, uh, to deliver this um, on scale, uh, to deliver this um, at this scale, on time, on budget, and um, in a safe manner. Uh, we reduce the costs uh, by reducing the material um, used and also the labor costs. And then we increase, increase the performance to produce um, more energy per unit of uh, land. So in this um, image, it gives you kind of a general layout um, and you can see the ML oil field in Oman and the Mira project um, is on the upper uh, right of the screen. Um, you can see the construction uh, progress to date um, and you can also see if you see here in the middle, uh, in the bottom center, um, that's where the pilot project is. So you can get a sense of the scale from going from seven megawatts to, um, to the uh, Mira project. So now if we zoom in, uh, you can see this is the progress as of a month ago, September. The construction site is about uh, 1.3 kilometers wide. Um, and we build and operate uh, the plants in blocks. So you can see here 12 blocks. And uh, four blocks basically share common equipment. And we call four blocks uh, one module. So each module is just a little over 100 megawatts. Um, and in the 12 blocks, we're looking at 300 megawatts um, under construction. So we just finished uh, block one um, and uh, we're doing some testings and producing some steam. So all these blocks will be complete by next year and we'll be able to deliver a third of a gigawatt um, to our customer. So if we zoom in even further, um, we can see here um, block one on the lower right, um, which has just been cleaned uh, by the automatic uh, washing system. Um, the block number two, um, that dust has been accumulated for three days. So you can see how the desert environment affects um, uh, the, uh, the, if it's not cleaned. And then block three and four, that's been 
I think for uh, two weeks there. So now block three and four and um, five, six, um, basically we let the dust accumulate so that um, it, it kind of shades the glass house underneath and it helps us keep the temperature down uh, for the crews um, when they install the mirrors at night. So we zoom in one more time. Um, here you can see uh, the equivalent of a power block. Um, so those four blocks share the common equipment. Um, so you can see the pumps and you can see the electric motors. Um, and, and the tank on the right um, basically holds enough water for uh, one, uh, one day at peak output. Um, here, if we zoom in, um, that's the view inside the greenhouse um, during construction. And if you see the black um, uh, receiver, um, that's our, um, the receiver um, over there. This is the automatic um, washing system. It's a robot um, and it cleans our, our glass house um, roof every single uh, night. Um, that's another image. And uh, this one here is a drone image. This to show you how um, dust, uh, soil and sand accumulates on the top. Um, here you can see um, that our workers work at night um, and basically we set up an on-site factory um, inside the greenhouse um, before the mirrors are installed. Um, here they're weld welding the receivers and um, we install roughly over 200 meters of receiver each night. And here um, you can see the plant um, has started uh, making steam. Um, so here, um, kind of looking at the results, uh, Mira is being executed um, on, uh, on schedule, um, on budget, and we just surpassed 1.5 million um, man hours without a lost time injury. Uh, we are now com in commissioning uh, process and we, have be uh, we began exporting steam uh, to the ML field. Uh, we have considerably uh, reduced costs, 55% uh, overall cost reduction to date. And we made um, technological um, improvements to increase uh, performance and output. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I just leave you with this uh, last image of um, the inside of the wall. I love that picture. You know that I told you yesterday. <laughs> it's uh, really evocative. Uh, you can actually switch off now if you like the presentation, so that we can um, we can talk. I've been looking. We have had a lot of questions. We unfortunately not going to have time to answer them all. Obviously. But I've kind of, and you know, thank you very much to Martin and all of the other speakers who've been answering those questions, Viera as well. Uh, I see here that you guys have been busy, you know, answering, I appreciate that. From what I've seen and I've, you know, observed, um, there are like three lines that people seem to be asking questions. And the, the first, and I think the most interesting, there's been a bunch of questions about this that I thought I'd bring up live here so that we can all um, sort of weigh in is, the ESCOS, ESCOS as you know, the, the business model or you know, the, you know, the mechanism by which this industry seems to be working better or seems like it should work better. Um, so there's a bunch of questions about that, whether it's successful, whether it has been done, whether something has been financed with this model. So who wants to take this question and like maybe go a little bit deep, a little bit deeper into mm -hmm. you know, how it works, what are the barriers, what are the payback times, um, financially, you know, how it's set up, Anyone who wants to take it? Yeah. Uh, if I can start, maybe. We do see this, this problem, which actually Martin mentioned, when companies uh, do decide about the investment and there is an internal competition for investment. So usually they would prefer investing and spending money on and capital on their core business and core processes production. From this point of view, uh, energy generation, regardless of which type of energy, including CSP, is something what is seen as utility and not a core business. So it's the same story as if, for example, cement plant uh, needs or would uh, needs considers investment in waste heat recovery to generate electricity. What we saw across all these types of projects, including solar PV, that so-called off-balance sheet, which is not necessary ESCO. This might be different forms and different types of structures, models, and arrangements uh, are the way to consider and finally decide. So it's not necessary in ESCO, but in general, off-balance sheet financing is something what's really relatively very attractive to the, to the manufacturing sector. 
we as IFC do provide this type of advice to clients or to, to other stakeholders if needed, and it's part of the standard engagement. Okay, anyone else wants to add to that? Rodrigo, yes, Martin, no? Okay, we can go to the next one if you like. Um, okay, there is a bunch of, sort of technical questions about what is the minimum DNI versus gas price? You know, what, you know, how does it work in terms of making it work technically um, uh, for uh, this particular technology? So what has the gas price got to be? What is the DNI got to be for it to be worth it? And what is like the, the payback time? Anyone wants to take that? I know it's very general and it's very difficult to answer with something specific, but anyone has any indication of that? Martin, perhaps? So as you said, it, uh, it depends as I also answer to one question. Um, someone wants numbers, so um, I throw something in. My feeling is that DNI below, let's say 1,700 and energy prices of less than um, three dollar cent per kilowatt hour is difficult to finance and this or is difficult to make feasible and this is the answer is for mainly valid for projects in below double digit megawatt scale so if you go to projects like um, what just mentioned from glass point for sure this is a order of magnitude times thousand you get other costs I hope well, helps. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit difficult to answer this thing, right? Because it's going to depend on the project itself. Um, there are also a couple of questions about that they are quite involved. And it says, um, accredited, uh, this is for you, Vera, actually. Accredited intermediaries from the Green Climate Front, are, for example, the AFC or the KFW. Um, and have you been approached uh, to finance, you know, solar process heat using this GCF, GCF money? I think this is this is a more complex question because the GF financing through IFC has a little bit different model. So it's not like we we act as intermediary to anybody being approached. It's more the setting up vehicles, facilities that do support financing a specific type of projects in a specific country. So we do run this type of projects. The opposite, I think if there is a more like substantial, substantiated question, which or, or do somebody wants to go into more details, I can put the person in contact with uh, respective colleagues who do manage this type of grants and engagements. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Vera. One very specific one for uh, Glass Point. Uh, what is the land area required for your project? You know, or the greenhouse surface area, very specific for you, uh, yes. We cannot hear you. Um, see. Okay, I'm afraid, like, he's, I'm, I'm afraid we've lost ears there, so I'm sorry about that. Um, Rodrigo, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to ask um, this question to Rodrigo then, and then we probably call it a day. Um, what are the solar heat prices that you reach in Chile? Do you happen to know this data? I know it's a little bit of an odd one. No, no, no. We, we, we don't have that. Uh, the, the prices for heat... We, uh, I, I just wanted to, to answer the, the first question that you did to, to hear about the, the ESCO model. So Please go ahead, yes. At least the biggest and, and maybe the most that we have in, in, in the mining, that is the, the one that I showed uh, from uh, Codelco, they are using the ESCO model. I think that that's the, the model that we should pursue. Uh, mining companies are not interested in investing in solar, so they are only waiting to have a supply of electricity or thermal energy as cheap and as, as clean as they can, but they are not concerned about uh, investing. So, uh, at least in the case of mining industry, there is no issue about <clears throat> financing. I, I think that there are several companies in, in Chile that can support, uh, and there is a, a, a market for financing projects uh, related to, to this. In, in, in the case you have a PPA from or, or or, or a contract from mining companies. So the, the main issue here is the awareness of the mining sector 
and also the the operational risk that they see they can they they are going to take if they change the process uh, they are used to use uh, the same kind of uh, fuel for the uh, heat uh, mainly diesel and they don't want to see the, the operation stop in some moment because they don't know the, the technology. So I, I think that the main risk uh, for operation is the main issue in, in the mining sector. So the ESCO model should be the model that we are going to be seeing in the future in, in mining sector. And the prices, so we, we don't have uh, this, uh, we, we don't have fossil fuels, we don't have gas, natural gas, we don't have coal, we don't have any uh, of these kind of fuels. We are plenty of uh, renewables, so for, for, for us, at least today, prices uh, of solar are way more cheaper than the, the fossil fuel options. Thank you very much, Rodrigo, and thank you very much, Viera, for uh, giving us context and, uh, and joining us today. Thank you very much, Martin, as well, for your time. And yes, although he had, the poor thing, technical difficulty, at least we managed to hear from him. Uh, thank you very much to all of the attendees as well. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but I hope that you found this uh, interesting and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye.